All right, we're going to get started here. <clears throat> All right. I want to welcome uh, those that um, are watching us by internet or you will be watching us by DVD at a later time. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and this is the second night of our prophetic conference. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you lesson number seven of our School of the Internet, which is part three of the School of the Prophetic. And last night I, I mentioned these, and I want to mention them again because uh, those who are uh, who are not with us in the sanctuary can order these. And what this is, this is the School of the Internet series. It's 26 DVDs that will give you everything you need to know in ministry, dealing with healing, uh, deliverance, salvation, uh, prophetic ministry and apostolic ministry and, mu and much, much more. And you can go to our website at wildfireonthemountain.com. That's wildfireonthemountain.com. It's all one word. And you can order this or you can order the School of the Prophets and it's a prophetic workshop. This is a seven-part series. Now, the 26 DVD series already has the seven-part series in it. So if you order this, you'll get, uh, you'll get it all. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm only going to be reading, I think, one scripture, and then I'm going to be uh, giving you a lot of information. <clears throat> I'm coughing here too, so I don't know. Could be the weather change we have because it has just turned cold this, uh, this week. Hebrews chapter 12. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you that what I'm going to do tonight is I want to teach Impart, activate, develop, and mature you in your prophetic gifts. And that's because the Bible says that we are to covet to prophesy. That's what it says. Covet to prophesy. It's one of the only two things that we are allowed to covet. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says, covet earnestly the best gifts. And 1 Corinthians 14, 39 says, covet to prophesy. So what that means is you are supposed to prophesy, period. You're supposed to covet it. In other words, you're supposed to go out and get it. You're supposed to make it yours. It's supposed to be a part of your Christian walk, period. I mean, it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. Now, I know that we do have some intercessors that will be watching uh, this video. So I want to tell you that all intercessors are prophetic, and all prophetic people are intercessors, whether they know it or not. And that's because it takes the prophetic to hear God as to what, when, where, and how to intercede for certain people, places, and things according to God's will. In other words, if you can't hear God, then you may not know God's will concerning certain matters, and you may be praying amiss. This especially applies to prophets and intercessors who do supernatural spiritual warfare. Now, I'll explain what that is because some of you may know. Uh, supernatural spiritual warfare is, is uh, intercessors that generally, they're prophetic, by the way, and I mentioned that. So the prophetic intercessors that can see into the spirit realm and God allows them to see into the spirit realm and they don't entertain fear when they look into the spirit realm. And they'll be making prophetic acts like they'll be cutting off the heads of dragons with swords or cutting off the snake's head and so forth. And these are prophetic acts that represents their spiritual warfare against Satan and his kingdom. Now, uh, as an alternative to doing prophetic intercession, you can use your prayer tongues to achieve some of the same results. However... Uh, it's best to be able to use both. And by that, I mean both your prayer tongues and your prophetic giftings. And especially if you are a uh, supernatural spiritual warrior for God's kingdom. Now, not everybody is called into the office of the prophet, but everyone, and I repeat, everyone is called to move in the prophetic, especially when serious intercession is required. 
See, when I, they told me I was an intercessor, I had a, uh, this is uh, years ago when I first got into ministry, uh, the prophets and uh, so forth told me I was an intercessor. And I, uh, my definition of being an intercessor said, no, I'm, I, I'm not that. Because I, I pictured, you know, being an intercessor was looking in the spirit realm, and I have looked into the spirit realm, and to me, I don't like it. I ask God to help me cast out demons and devils without seeing them, and uh, he, he does. So I said, well, I don't think I'm really an intercessor. Well, they said, you're a prophet, aren't you? I said, well, yeah. They said, you're an intercessor. In other words, I am an intercessor with the use of the prophetic. If you took the prophetic away from me, I probably would not be an intercessor. You see, that's how the two work hand in hand. So reading in Hebrews chapter 12, just going to read one verse. Look at verse 25. It says, see that you refuse not him. Who's him? God. See that you refuse not God that speaketh. You know what he's saying? You cannot refuse God when he's speaking to you. Therefore, he's saying you need to know how to move in the prophetic. And again, this is a commandment. It's not a suggestion. He says, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth. Now, who is he referring to? He's referring to the children of Israel. You can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 8. I've taught on it before, but I'll just give you a kind of paraphrase what that's about. That's the uh, time when uh, God came down, and actually he, he, he was going to speak to everybody. But um, the children of Israel pretty much said, Oh, Moses, we don't want to hear his voice. Oh, we don't want to hear his voice. So you just go up on the mountain. You hear what he says. You come down and tell us, and we'll do it. Well, God speaks with power, and if they would have heard God with the power of the prophetic, they probably wouldn't have got into the sin and iniquity that followed. But because they sent Moses up there, and he was going to be their mediator, and he comes back and he speaks, Moses did not speak in the same power that God himself spoke in. Therefore, they eventually fell into sin and iniquity, and you all know the story, the golden calf and so forth. So what they did is they refused uh, to hear God. It says, uh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, that's what I'm talking about, Deuteronomy chapter 8, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Now, what this is, is a warning to us to learn to hear God through the prophetic. I mean, it is a, an outright commandment. And I don't understand why preacher, preachers can, can, can read this stuff and not get that and see that when it's speaking right to them. I'm talking about preachers that don't believe in the prophetic, pre preachers that don't want the prophetic in their church and so forth. Now, this uh, verse also being a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 5, that is where children of Israel refused to hear God's voice, and as a result, they ended up paying a severe price when Moses came down from the mountain because God commanded him to slay about 3,000 of them. So that's a warning to us that we will pay some severe consequences if we refuse to hear God. And you pastors and preachers out there that don't want prophetic ministry in your church, you think you're the only ones hearing God, and you're probably not hearing God. Because if you was hearing God, he would be telling you to train your parishioners to hear him. Because God came down to the children of Israel, and he, his plan, and you can read it on your own time, his plan was to speak to everyone. And actually, he did. He spoke to them, and it just scared them so bad. And if you read that, oh, let me go to it really quick. Cause, uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, I think it is. Make sure I'm in the right place. 7, 8. Um, let me see if I'm in the right place. No, I'm sorry. Fire, fire. I'll just have to paraphrase a little more. Jim would know where that was. I haven't taught on it in a, quite a while. It's five, isn't it? Yeah. Is it Deuteronomy five? Yeah. It's uh, Deuteronomy five. Uh, look at verse 23. This is not in my notes. We'll get back to that in a moment. He says, these, uh, verse 22, 522, these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly. See, he spoke to everyone. It's not like the, in the movie where uh, we just know he spoke to Moses only. He spoke to all your assembly in the mount 
out of the midst of the fire of cloud and of a thick darkness with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. See, he was speaking to everybody when he uh, gave uh, Moses the first set of the Ten Commandments. Verse 23, and it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. So they were all there when he spoke. Look at 24, and you shall behold the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God does talk with man, and he liveth. So what they're saying is we know now that God can speak to us, and it's not going to kill us. But look at the next verse. Now, therefore, why should we die? Think about it. The verse before that, they're saying, oh, we heard God's voice, and it didn't destroy us. And now they're saying, why should we die? He says, for this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more than we shall die. So you can see in verse 24, I think it is, they know they're going to live and they can hear God's voice. In verse 25, they're saying God's voice is going to kill them. So what happened between them two verses? They become demonized. And the devil is telling them you will die if you hear God's voice. Now, that's what you pastors out there are hearing. If you believe you don't have to hear God's voice, who's telling you that? You're demonized. I'm sorry. Then it goes on to say, verse 26, For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of fire as we have and lived? For one thing, they have. <laughs> they heard him and lived. Moses heard him and lived. You see how ridiculous this is? Because they take out the... Uh, factor of the, 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 the demonic overtaking the children of Israel. And if you take out the demonic factor, which you pastors don't, don't believe in deliverance, that's what you're doing to your people. You're allowing them to be demonized where the devil is telling them that they don't need to hear God. And you are demonized if you believe that. Then look at verse 27. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak the, thou unto us, uh, that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. In other words, Moses, we don't want to hear God because it will kill us. One verse they say we've already heard God we didn't die. Now they say we don't want to hear him, it will kill us. The devil's entered in. So you, Moses, you go up, you hear what he says, and you just tell us. Isn't that the church today? Oh, we don't need to hear God. we got a pastor that, 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 that tells us what God has to say every Sunday between uh, 11 and 12, well, 11 and 11, 11.55, because we got to get out early to make it to the local buffet on Sunday mornings. It's ridiculous. It's not godliness. It's not the Bible. I'm sorry. Then look at 28. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spake unto me. In other words, he heard them when they said, we don't want to hear you, God. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken. Who's they? You could, in, one, in a primary interpretation, you could say it was the people speaking. In the secondary application, he knows it's the demonic that's in them that's speaking. They have spoken unto thee. In other words, the demons have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. In other words, everything they spoke, the demonic realm spoke through them. God is saying they spoke well. They voiced their opinion. They don't want to hear me. And if they don't want to hear me, then I'm not going to speak to them. Look at 29. Then he says, oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me. See, they didn't have the fear of the God. They had the fear of the devil because Satan had entered into them. And keep my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. You know what he's talking about? If you don't want to hear God, you bring in a generational curse on you and your children you and your family. And you pastors out there don't believe in the prophetic and don't think your congregation needs to hear God because they got you. That's a spirit of pride. It's braggadocious. It's not of the Bible. It's not of God. Plus, you bring in generational curses on yourself and them. Verse 30, go say to them, get you into your tents again. In other words, get out of my face. I don't want to even hang around you. That's what he's saying. 
And when you understand that, you can understand that the prophetic actually is, if not one of the most important ministries in the church, it is the most important because you'll pay a consequence when you refuse to hear God. And those people who know we're having uh, a, a prophetic conference here, yet they don't want to come because they don't believe, well, God won't, God don't speak to them. They're just uh, a bunch of weird people making this up. You just brought a generational curse on yourself because you refuse to hear from him who speaks from heaven. So what this verse, and I'm talking about Hebrew 12.25, is saying is that we're commanded to hear from God as he speaks from his throne in heaven. We're commanded. In other words, we're commanded to move in the ministry of, of the prophetic to one degree or another, and all of us can move in different degrees. As we grow in Christ, there's different levels. Now, the term prophetic simply means hearing God's voice for yourself or for someone else. And like I said, it's not a suggestion, it's a commandment. See, you got to understand, when you get these things that God is telling you to do and you don't do them, you're in rebellion. That means you're in sin. You're in iniquity. I mean, Saul lost his kingdom, King Saul, out of rebellion. Remember? He says, uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. It cost Saul his kingdom. Now, there's three main categories by which God speaks and communicates with us. Number one is seeing. Number two is hearing. Number three is through feeling. Seeing is the ability to actually see by the Spirit, and it can be divided into three specific categories, mental images, visions, and dreams, which are sometimes called night visions. For the most part, many people see in the realm of mental images or pictures, while open visions and night visions are usually less prevalent. The term mental images can best be described as receiving mental pictures which are prompted by the Holy Spirit to our human spirit. For some people, they come as an instantaneous mental picture, but for others, the images slowly develop in their mind's eye, much like that of a Polaroid camera. And I explained uh, last night the type of cameras we used to use where you'd pull the picture out and you'd watch it develop right in front of you. Now, like the Polaroid camera, the believer simply opens the shutter of their heart to the Lord, that's called yielding to the Spirit, and he asks for a thought from the throne and then waits upon the Lord for a mental image to begin to develop in their mind's eye. And sometimes uh, I've had that happen. I get the first picture, and then he'll expand it, and by the time he's through, um, I get a whole mural. I remember one time at the church in uh, Huntsville, God just kind of took me out in the Spirit, and he started showing me pictures, and it grew in the murals, and I just kept... I'm in front of the congregation now. Uh, I think it was during praise and worship, or my, no, it was during a training session. And I was, I saw a mural that lasted about 20 minutes. For 20 minutes, I kept giving it. Finally, I heard this voice in my ear, and it was the pastor come up and says, "You need to give somebody else a chance." I had no idea it was 20 minutes. I asked Carol and some of the people, because I, I thought it was like you know, 30 seconds, you know. And I said, no, you, you've been with this word for about 20 minutes. And, of course, it kind of brought me out of it, and it was the Lord uh, actually teaching me some things as well as uh, it was time for me to let somebody else have a chance. But I saw a, a mural and interpreted it for about 20 minutes. Now, as an example of what we call a mental picture, if we were to hear, say, uh, 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 if we were to hear to say the word apple, most of us would immediately picture this big, red, bright, red apple in our mind's eye. It can be done with any image. It can be done with a tree, a car, a house, anything. Now, I'll give you an illustration. Back uh, some of the training we used to have. See, I don't have time to do prophetic training like every Wednesday night or Friday night of every week because the people around here get burned out quick. They'll come because it's all, it sounds exciting, and then when they got to do something, a lot of them just leave. We saw that last night. So I have to, I go to the Lord, and I say, Lord, I could do this, but unless you tell me to do it, we're not going to do it. And I only do it when he tells me to do it, and y'all are part of the reason why he's told me to do it now. But people used to come to me, and they'd say, well, I'm about ready to buy a car. Can you tell me which car to buy? And I'd close my eyes, and I'd see a red car. 
or I see a green car, whatever color. And I'd say, well, I see the red car. So are you looking at the red car? And they'd say, yeah, that's the car. we're looking at a red one and a black one, or a red one and a white one. I said, well, the red car is your car. And they'd take it. Or they'd come to me and say, we're planning on taking a vacation. We don't know where to go. And i close my eyes, and the Lord give me a picture of the Caribbean or Florida or or in, in the case of this one lady I mentioned last night, uh, California. See, that's how in tune you can become. I don't do that much anymore because I don't have the time to, uh, to do that. I mean, if you come up to me and had a problem and ask me, I can go to God and see what he says. A lot of them come up with a yes or no. I need a yes or no on this thing I'm deciding. And I just look and he just shows me a yes or a no. I've done that also with, with um, pregnant women. I mean, that for a while there I thought, Lord, you know, is this all I'm going to see? Because I could go in the restaurant and a pregnant waitress would come over and Lord, I so tell her it's a boy. I say, you know, you're going to have a boy. She says, no, I don't know. I haven't had the ultrasound yet. They'd have an ultrasound. They'd say, yeah, it was a boy. In fact, one time uh, I remember it was a a girl and they wanted a boy. And I said, well, you're going to have a boy. Uh, our uh, granddaughter, uh, when our son. Uh, son's wife was pregnant. He wanted a boy. And the Lord told me to tell him he's going to have a girl. <laughs> and Carol remembers that. And I kind of, I think I probably told Carol and let her deliver that because he really wanted a boy. And sure enough, he had a, a girl. And me, and me I, I mean, I had a daughter. I mean, I just, if I have my choice, most people want a boy, but I just soon have a girl. I mean, because I, I think like I was a little boy and I think, boy, they're mischievous. They get all into trouble and all you all these little girls are like innocent, you know. Yeah, all the women in here are laughing, right? <laughs> uh, so this, uh, in this particular way, the Lord communicates to our human spirit by bringing uh, forth any mental picture to our mind that he so desires, and especially those which we have come in contact with in previous times in our lives. In other words, God will give us pictures of things we have seen and experienced in the past. See, and I've traveled a lot, and I realize uh, one of the reasons God wanted me to travel a lot is because I see a lot of scenes. People come up and say, uh, you know, well, uh, we're thinking about going to Texas or we're going to go to Arizona. Where, which one should you go? And I'll close my eyes and I'll see the Grand Canyon. I say, well, that's not in Texas, so guess where you're going. You say, God will use everything. You're like a computer, and he's been putting all this stuff in you all your life, and that's what he's going to use to speak to you. Now, people who hear God in this particular fashion are called seers. I am a seer. Some of y'all out there are a seer. Uh, Carol, were you a seer first? Or Yeah, and you prayed to the Lord you could hear, and then you became a hearer. So if you're one and you want the other, all you got to do is ask. God's looking for people to speak to. He's looking for people that he can speak to that will speak to his people because his people, a lot of times, like children of Israel, they don't want to hear him. But there's times when they're going to have to hear him. So he'll, uh, he'll give you what you want. Now, as a biblical illustration of a seer, we can see the father communicating to Jesus about Nathaniel in a picture form of a word of knowledge, and that's referenced in John uh, chapter 1, verses 47 and 48. And it says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. In other words, he wasn't a bad guy. Then Nathanael asked Jesus, he said, Whence knowest thou me? In other words, how, how, how did you know me? He, Jesus answered and said unto him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So Jesus was a seer. So through the prophetic, Jesus saw Nathanael and discerned his spirit before he ever met him. Now this was an operation of the gift of the word of knowledge in conjunction with the gift of discerning of spirits that's spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we can see that Jesus was a seer. Now the term vision refers to a supernatural occurrence where the Lord chooses to open our physical eyes to the spirit realm, and it's usually for a limited time only. In other words, if he left your eyes open to the spirit realm, you wouldn't sleep good. <laughs> You'd be tormented most of the time. You'd be doing spiritual warfare 24-7, and you wouldn't have time to do anything else. So he only opens it for a limited period of time. Now, an example of this can be found in 2 Kings 6, verse 17, and it says, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open the eyes of my servant that he may see. 
And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now, this is what we call an open vision. It's much like watching a movie screen, and I've had a few of those in my life. In Isaiah 6, verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, that's one of the songs we uh, sing when Paul's here, and it's called... Uh, I see the Lord. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. It's a very anointed song. It's taken from that scripture, Isaiah 6 1. Acts 7 55 says, But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Stephen was no doubt a seer. Acts 10 3 says, He, that's Cornelius, saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him. Acts 10, verses 10 and 11 says, And he, Peter, became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready the food, he fell into a trance, trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him. You remember that's when he, this uh, uh, big uh, I don't know, blanket or something comes down and it's got all these unclean animals in it. That's... Uh, what uh, Peter saw. Now, let me explain a trance. A trance is as if you are personally part of the vision. And I've had maybe one, one for sure I can think of, maybe two of those. In other words, you can still interact with your surroundings while being in the trance. And I'll tell you about one in a moment that, uh, that happened to me when I was on the interstate doing about 70 miles an hour on the way to my grandmother's funeral in Florida from Nashville. Now, the term dream or night vision refers to mental pictures which the Lord chooses to give by way of a dream format. This type of pictorial communication many times involves symbols, types, and shadows of earthly entities. In other words, God can speak to you in dreams through the use of a symbolic language. Now, if you want to learn how to interpret dreams, I highly recommend this particular book. It's by Ira Milligan, I-R-A, Ira Milligan, M-I-L-L-I-G-A-N, and it's entitled Understanding the Dreams You Dream. Now, some of y'all got this book? Yeah. I would recommend that you ask God for the interpretation first. If for some reason you ain't getting it all or getting enough or you're not hearing him that day or whatever, then I would say go to the book. And then after you go to a book and get something, then ask God again, is this what you're trying to tell me? And, and all you got to hear then is a yes or a no. You don't have to hear everything. Now, for, um, for an example of a night or a dream or a night vision, we can read in Genesis 20, verse 3, where it says, God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman thou hast taken for she is a man's wife. Now, this is where the Philistine king, his name is Abimelech, took Abraham's wife, Sarah, and in a dream, God threatened to kill him if he didn't return her. And boy, he returned her. That was a powerful dream. Another example can be found in Numbers twelve six, which says, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. 1 Kings 3, 5 says, The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. Daniel 7, 2 says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night. Now, you got to remember, God is no respecter of persons. See, the average Christian reads this stuff, and they've been taught that all that happened to Daniel, all that happened to uh, uh, whoever in the Bible, and that was their special people. No, they were special people, but you're special people too because you're created in the image of a prophetic God. That makes you special. So he's no respecter of persons. Anything they saw and did, you can do it as well. The problem you have is you've been so churched that you can't get beyond that churchianity into the spirit realm to really hear God. And that's because your pastors aren't teaching it. They aren't reading like Deuteronomy chapter uh, 5, uh, you know, where the children of Israel didn't want to hear God and they uh, brought generational curses on themselves. They p uh, pay, paid a severe penalty. They don't want to read you that, you see. They want to read you stuff that uh, comes out of the church hierarchy, and, and it's just church junk. That's what it is. It's church junk. It's, if it's not biblical, it's church junk. And I uh, used the word last night because it is biblical. It's dung, and that is biblical. 
And that's what they've been doing, and that's what they will continue to do unless apostolic ministry gets out there and starts telling them the truth. Now, in the New Testament, Matthew one twenty says, But while he, that's Joseph, thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee Mary as thy wife. This was Jesus' earthly parents. You all know the story. Acts 18, 9 says, Then spake the Lord to Paul, this is the apostle Paul, in the night by, the, by a vision. He said, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. Now, what this scripture shows us is that God can impart boldness to us by speaking to us through the prophetic. Now, that's happened to me. Actually, it happened to me last night when we had a, a few people walk out. I go, Lord, I don't even know if I want to teach this stuff. They don't care. I felt like Samuel. Remember Samuel went to the Lord and says, Lord, they rejected me. And God says, no, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. Last night, that's kind of what, and that's, you know, that's, that's how the devil kind of gets a hold of you because he wants to stop this type of ministry. And then I got a prophetic word from Sister Sally that brought me right back on top of it all. Uh, so it brought me back into the boldness I'm speaking Right now, when I look at the camera and I tell these pastors, you people need to get with God's plan in these last days or you're going to be left out of it. Acts 16, 9 says, And a vision appeared to Paul, the apostle Paul, in the night there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him. That means he begged him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, this is what's known scripturally as the Macedonian call. So he saw this person, a real live person, that was in the, uh, the vision, the night vision, the dream, and he was telling him to go come to Macedonia because we need help. So we can see that God can commission us through the prophetic. See, that's why if you're in ministry, you've got to have prophetic ministry as part of your ministry because God will commission you through it. Last night he spoke to me twice to call two of these, uh, uh, Joe and Valerie, into the office of the prophet and the prophetess. Now, there's going to be more training because I know when I went from the prophetic into the office of the prophet, I had to learn a lot more stuff, and uh, a lot more stuff was required of me. And let me explain how I came into ministry. I was called as a prophetic person. I was called to be prophetic. So I go home to my wife, and I said, well, whatever that means, I guess I'll learn whatever it means. I had no clue. I would never heard this stuff. About six months later, I was called into the office of the prophet. About the time I learned what it meant to be prophetic by studying the word, I was called in the office of the prophet. Then I had to go and learn what it meant to be in the office of the prophet. And then I'm called into the apostolic about the time I learned some of the things that's required of me of being in the office of the prophet. But I learned what it was to be apostolic. And then I'm called into the office of the apostle, and I had to learn that again. That's how I came in. So each thing is a stepping stone to a higher level. And God does that because uh, I had to learn about the prophetic. Why? So I can teach you about the prophetic. Then I had to learn what it, what, uh, what's required as you walk in the office of the prophet. Why? Because some of you are going to walk in and are walking in the office of the prophet. And, and, and it applies also to the apostolic and the office of the apostle. You've got to know what's required of you so you can teach it to people. Now, Isaiah 55, verse 12 says, For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now, in other words, through commissioning, because it says, For you shall go out, through commissioning by way of the prophetic, we can experience both a joy and a peace. See, when God sends you out, you're apostolic. You're sent one. A lot of them aren't, they weren't really sent. They just kind of got up and went. That's not apostolic. And you won't go with the joy and peace of God sending you out. Now, the following verse, Isaiah 55, 13, says, Instead of a thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Now, this scripture spoke peace to me in the prophetic before I even knew I was a seer, before I even knew I was a hearer before I knew I was going to be prophetic in the office of the prophet, apostolic, and then in the office of the apostle. So we're talking some years back. Now, in my mind, when I read this, 
I saw my mother's myrtle tree. Do you remember her myrtle tree? She had a myrtle tree. And these things would grow on the myrtle tree. <laughs> she, and she'd say, watch. And all these birds would kind of get up there. And they'd be a, a herd of birds. And all of a sudden, whoosh, down in this myrtle tree, and they'd pick every one of those whatever myrtle, myrtle nuts or whatever they were off the tree, and it'd be bare. And I remembered that. And I said, well, wow, what kind of tree is that? Said, it's a myrtle tree. And I remembered that. And see, God knew that. So in my mind, I saw my mother's myrtle tree, and I felt a great peace about going to visit her. Because there was one time when I thought, well, I don't know if I should go visit her now, or should I go? I was working with Freddie Fender at the time, so should I wait till after the next gig or whatever? <clears throat> but I felt uh, peace. Now, had God not commissioned me and given me the peace and joy to go, because I did go, I would have missed one of the last chances I had to see my mother alive because she went to be with the Lord a few months later. So you see how important the prophetic is? You can look back and you say, wow, Lord, just thank you that I saw the myrtle tree and you put it in the Bible and you spoke it to me directly. When I read it, he spoke it. That's the piece. So I was a seer before I even knew what the prophetic was, which tells me that seers may be born with the gift whether they know it or not. And I believe Everyone really that's prophetic is born with a gift, whether they know it or not, because they're created in the image of a prophetic God. Now, I don't know that all apostles are born uh, with that gift because I think uh, God had to take me through the training process to get me up to that level. And see, being in the office of the apostle, that's the highest level you can go. God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's the fivefold ministry. And when you read, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says uh, God put in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. Pastors aren't even mentioned. First is the Greek word proton, which means first in place, rank, and order. As an apostle in the office of the apostle, you are first in place, rank, and order. So God could not give me that right away. He had to teach me how to, 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 to live with it, how to handle it, because it's a different it's the highest office you can have. It's higher than priest. Now, the priest would minister to the Lord, but the apostles are the ones that would actually operate the church. Apostles can do things. And sometimes I'll teach on, on uh, the office of the apostle, and you'll understand. There's things that someone in the office of the apostle can do that other ministries can't do, many things. And you had to, I had to learn that. Now, if an apostle isn't around, God will raise up an apostolic or a highly apostolic person, and he will anoint them for that special uh, thing that he's needing done that an apostle is not available to do. And he does that same thing in the prophetic. If there's not a someone in the office of the prophet that's available at a certain time when God needs them uh, quickly or instantly or immediately, then he'll raise up a highly prophetic person. Therefore, that's why he wants you to become highly prophetic because he can use you in a, cri in a crisis. He can use you when um, uh, there's no one around, else around that he, he can use for a certain situation. Now, the second category of communication through, uh, through the prophetic is by hearing. Proverbs 20, verse 12 says, The hearing ear... And the seeing eye, the Lord has made both of them. I'm a hearer and a seer. Some of y'all are as well. While some individuals are more sensitive in the realm of seeing, others are more receptive in the realm of hearing. Hearing the voice of God can come as an audible voice or it can come as a strong mental thought which originates from the Holy Spirit and is given to our human spirit. According to Hebrews 5.14, as the believer grows in maturity and discernment through practice and use, they, become, uh, they begin to cultivate a spiritual ear to differentiate between the voice of the human soul and the voice of the Holy Spirit. Many times it's the still small voice of the Holy Spirit that people discern when they speak religious cliches, and we've all heard them, like the Lord said, or I heard the Lord say, or the Lord told me such and such, or something to that effect, or the effect that God had spoken to them. Now, I've heard a lot of pastors say that in the pulpit. Uh, I could take a rough guess, and I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I bet you 50% of them didn't really hear God. They just learned to say that. Because usually if you check out their fruit, they're not a, uh, a minister that really believes in the prophetic. The prophetic is not moving in their church. They're not teaching it, and they're not doing it, and the Bible commands that they should be. Now, according to 1 Kings chapter 19, the prophet Elijah 
experienced this type of communication for God when he was on Mount Horeb. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13 says, And he, the Lord, said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. See, God could do all this stuff, and you can say, Oh, that must be God speaking to me. Not necessarily. He could just be ready to speak to you in a still, small voice. Another verse that refers to the Holy Spirit speaking to us in the form of a still, small voice can be found in Isaiah 30, verse 21. It says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right and when ye turn to the left. In other words, we are required to hear God in our daily life. That means our walk on earth. I mean, this scripture alone will tell you that. And it's a command. First Samuel 3.10 says, And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. What God did, and you all know the story, what he did is he used Eli's voice to speak to Samuel. That's why Samuel would run over there to Eli the first couple times or so and say, I'm here. And Samuel said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And then you hear it again. Come over. I'm here. Because God was using Samuel's voice because at that time, Samuel was the only voice that, um, I mean, excuse me, Eli was the only voice that Samuel really trusted because he was kind of alone. They, they just dropped him off at the, at the uh, temple there or wherever, and, um, and, and Eli pretty much raised him. Now, I'll give you an illustration of that. Um, and this was a, a trance. Remember I told you in a trance, you could still do whatever you've been doing. If you happen to be ironing or something and you go into a trance, you'll keep ironing. And you see all this going on. Well, I was driving down the interstate about 70, 75 miles an hour back when it was 55. You all remember that. Because my grandmother had died. My grandmother I loved dearly because she's the woman that, that raised me. She's the woman that really molded me into what I am today because if she had not, I'd have probably still I'd be in reform school and maybe even prison, so I owed her a lot. But she had died. She was like my mom, you know, my true mother. So I was uh, traveling down the interstate to try to get to the funeral in time, and I was speeding, of course. And tears were rolling down my eyes. I couldn't even see the road, and, I mean, it was a mess. I mean, everybody else in the car was asleep, so they didn't know that... I was somewhat endangering them, you know. And then all of a sudden, this big sphere of energy came, and it came right into the car between, it was halfway out of the car where the windshield is, halfway in. And in this big fear, uh, sphere of energy, I heard my grandmother's voice, and it spoke to me, and it told me some things that came to pass later. But at the time, I'm thinking it's my grandmother, and it was really God using her voice. See, he created her voice. He can use her voice. And what he was doing now, uh, later on, and I had prophecies from a, uh, a prophet that was at the church. This was a Herman Stalvey's church in Florida. And he told me, he, that's what he told me. So that wasn't her voice. That was God using her voice. And I was like, you know, I didn't know. Him. This was years ago. Before I was in ministry, I thought, no, that was her voice. I recognized it anywhere. Well, later on, I mean, if you study the Bible, you can understand. That's what happened to Samuel. And he used her voice because it caused me to still be able to drive. And also, I re realized later that when he spoke to me, there was power. There was power to make me calm. I quit crying. I became normal. I didn't feel the grief anymore. It was gone. And when I got to the funeral, everybody else was crying, but I couldn't cry. Because God had spoke that power in me to get through that trying times. Now, there's been times in the past when I kind of got emotional because I missed her, but all through the funeral, I didn't. But that he spoke to me in that trance while I'm driving 70 miles down the road. Now, Psalm 85, verse 8 says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. He will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Another word for folly is trouble. Now, what this scripture is saying is that the prophetic will not only speak peace into our lives, 
like it did with me going to Florida uh, to see my mother's myrtle tree. So it not only will speak peace into our lives, but it will also keep us out of trouble. It'll keep us out of folly. See how important it is? All these things that prophetic ministry will do for you, you have to have in order to keep walking in God's kingdom. Isaiah 6, 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. Now, the term send refers to apostolic ministry, sent ones. As an apostolic person, God will send you to wherever he wants you to go by speaking to you directly through the prophetic. An apostolic person, pay attention, this is a profound statement. An apostolic person without the prophetic cannot, and I repeat, cannot fulfill all their God-given purpose in life. You cannot. Because you're fulfilling it without hearing him and hearing the directions. And you'll get caught up in folly. You'll get caught up in in troubles. You won't have the power spoken to you. You've got to hear God. Now, another example of the communication of the Lord by the process of hearing can be found in 2 Kings 7, verse 6, which says, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to come upon us. This particular scripture shows us that the Lord can speak fear into the hearts of our enemies through the prophetic, if he so chooses. Through the act of the prophetic, we the believers can also speak fear into the hearts of our enemies, Satan and his demonic horde, for example, through the prophetic. And it's called prophetic deliverance. If you want to do deliverance to the highest degree that you can do it, then you want to be uh, able to hear God to the highest degree you can possibly hear him. Prophetic deliverance is one of the many tools by which we are called to torment Satan rather than him torment us. See, you remember when uh, Jesus walked up to uh, this person who was demonized and a demon spoke to him and says, have you come to torment us before our time? Jesus pretty much said yes, and he told him, come out. Others, he was there to torment. See, we're supposed to torment Satan. That shouldn't be your whole ministry. You just don't stand there in 24 hours and deliverance tormenting every demon you can find. But you're supposed to torment in the way that they know they're going back to hell. They know that you have the power through the prophetic to hear God how to speak in certain cases to get them out because some of them are, are uh, hard to get out. Some of them uh, you've got to do some other things to rout them out, and you deliverance ministers know that. I know that because I've been doing deliverance for years. But God can give you the perfect thing to say, and they'll come out. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give unto you, that's you, the saints, that's you. I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. What's that? That's demons and devils. That's what a ser- a serpents and scorpions represent, demons and devils. He says, I give you the power and over all the power of the enemy. Now, the third and final way by which God communicates with us is through the prophetic act of impressions, sensings, and feelings. From time to time, I've moved in this, but as you get older, I move less in it because as your body ages, you have a lot of of pain, aches and pains that uh, aren't necessarily prophetic. It's called aging. While some believers are more receptive to the seeing or hearing mode, that's where I am, there are yet others who hear the voice of the Holy Spirit mostly through impressions. For them, a word of knowledge in regard to healing usually comes as a physical sensation in their body. And I explained that last night. You can walk into, say, a, a situation where you're going to be ministering and you don't have any aches and pains, and all of a sudden you've got a pain in your elbow or anywhere. That's God telling you there's someone out there that has a pain in their elbow. And you need to, that's a word of knowledge. And you need to say, someone out there has a pain in their elbow. Come up here. God's going to heal it. And you'll be surprised. It'll be 100% every time you say that. Let me explain something to you. If you get that, it's there. If you say, get a pain, and I pick that. Oh, pain in the shoulder. Let's just pick that. Or you get this pain, right? That means somebody out there has got that pain. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line because God gives it to you when you're giving it to you because you didn't have it. Now, you may say... <clears throat> Someone has a pain right here. The uh, Lord wants to heal you. Come forward, and nobody moves. 
I've had that happen before. <clears throat> and then later, afterwards, they'll come up to you and say, would you pay, pray for my shoulder? Uh, you know, and I'm like, what was that about? Because, see, my, my thinking is like, no, I don't want to pray for your shoulder. God spoke it, you should have come up. See, you kind of got to give them a break because they were shy. They didn't want to come up front or they got all these excuses when they should have just marched up there and let God heal them. And that's happened. So when you get that pain and you speak it, it's out there. They may not come forward with it. One time I had a lady, <laughs> I was giving her a prophetic word and I picked it. I said, um, I see a relationship and the relationship is you're, with this person is really really bad. The relationship's really bad. She said, no, no, I have a relationship good with everybody. No, I don't have anybody. Okay. Then she comes up to me after the service and says, would you pray for my marriage? It's on the rocks. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you know, so you, you got to take that into consideration. Now, say the person that wouldn't come up because they had the pain in the shoulder. That's the devil using them to make you look bad. That's what it is. They don't know it. You can't tell them. That lady who should have come up or, or when I, I saw the relationship because I would have prayed for it. You know, that's the, and, and people hear me because I'm on a microphone. And I'm saying, no, there's a relationship. She says, no, I don't, I don't have a bad relationship. They weren't around later when she came to me privately and says, will you pray for my marriage? It's on the rocks. So they, the devil, used her to make me look bad. Of course, that's part of walking in the office of the apostle. You are going to look bad. You're going to be the scrapings of one's feet. I taught on that, and you know what I'm talking about. Uh, in other words, you're going to be low on the ladder in certain people's eyes, and that's just the way you got to do it. But you got to abide by the truth, and you're working for him. You're not working for man. Uh, now, while some, uh, let's see, others may tend to sense a slight impression in their spirit, such as a deep inward knowing. That means you know that you know that you know. A deep inward knowing about a person, situation, predicament, or a particular circumstance of some type. This is equivalent to what we Pentecostals sometimes refer to as having a witness in the spirit. You know, can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Yeah. Now, some saints tend to feel the emotions of another person as their particular method of hearing God. I knew one lady that's she would hear God and she'd have the compassion. She'd just have emotion for them or whatever. While others may receive what is known as a slight impression, which is confirmed by an overwhelming peace. In other words, if you get this and you feel peaceful about it, guess what? The devil probably didn't give that to you. God gave it to you. Matthew 27, 19 says, When he, Pontius Pilate, was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, Jesus, for he, I have suffered, I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. The word suffered in the Greek is the, is the Greek word apostio, which means to experience a sensation or an impression. And that's what she experienced. This is a reference to Pontius Pilate's wife's dream about Jesus going before Pilate. And y'all know the, know the story. He was getting ready to condemned Jesus to death, really. And um, she sent him this note saying, don't do it. Don't have nothing to do with him because she had suffered that night before in a dream. So that was a, uh, an impression that she had. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Hebrews 10.34 says, For you had compassion of me in my bonds. Now, what we see in these two passages of Scripture is that in Jesus' ministry, that's who the, was speaking, feelings of compassion were quite evident just before healings and miracles took place. And that's according to Matthew. Y'all can write this down. I'm putting it on the, uh, on the video. Matthew 9, 36, Matthew 14, 14, Mark 6, 34, Mark 8, 2, and Luke 10, 33. It's on there, so uh, you people watch the uh, video. You can go back and, and uh, reverse it and go back and watch it over and over to get all those scriptures if you need to. The sensation of feeling compassion played a big part in Jesus' healing and deliverance ministry. Now, many times I've prayed for people out of compassion, especially children. It's easy to have compassion for children. 
And they were healed because it was God's way of speaking to me and telling me what he was feeling and what he wanted me to do. That's what we were talking about earlier. Um, Sister Valerie and I, God will give you his feelings. You'll start crying and weeping and you have all these uh, uh, emotional things happening. You say, why am I doing this? This isn't normally me. It's him. However, as a warning, we must be careful not to get our personal emotions confused with God's compassion. And how you do that is like what I just said. You think, that's not me. So who is it? It's him. Unlike compassion, emotionalism can sometimes be totally self-serving in the realm of personal selfishness, and it can oftentimes tend to give place to fleshly spirits, such as the spirit of self-pity, depression, loneliness, and similar, and similar other demons. Through these particular spirits, the enemy could be setting you up for a fall. In other words, he can make you feel that you're getting the compassion, and then when you pray for this person, they don't get healed. You've been set up for a fall. So you can be set up for a fall by Satan as well as to, he can do it to disappoint the person that you're praying for and steal their faith when they don't receive their anticipated healing. See how you got to watch all this stuff? This isn't simple. The simple part actually is hearing him. The rest is knowing how to use what he gives you. Therefore, you've got to hear him even more. So you ask, well, how do I say this? How do I do this, Lord? Is this really you? You've got to give me some clarification, Lord. I'm, I don't know yet what to do, and I'm going to stand here until you tell me what to do. Uh, early in, uh, in our ministry, there's many times when I go into the church, and I didn't have any messages because everything message I had was prophetic. I mean, I never went down to the store and bought a book of sermons. Everything I get is like Deuteronomy, I think it's uh, 32 2, where Moses said it drops like rain from heaven. That's prophetic messages. They're apostolic messages that come through the prophetic. So I would have these type of messages. So when I started in ministry, I didn't have very many messages. You can only get about, you know, one a week, you know, because there are messages you'll spend 30 hours on. I've spent, I spent on average 30 hours on a Sunday morning message. Because it's a message that God gives me, it's prophetic, and then I have to spend time aligning up with the Word because I'm not going to get up here and teach to the world and tell them a bunch of stuff without giving them the Scriptures to back it up because they don't even listen to me when I give them the Scriptures. Just think what they're going to say about me if I didn't give them any Scriptures. So that takes time, 30 hours on the average per sermon. So in the early, my early uh, ministry career, I didn't have any of these, one at a time and one at a time. So what I had to do was I'd come into the church and say, well, I don't have a, a message this morning, so we're just going to stand here until God tells me what we're going to do. You remember those days? And I would. I'd stand there 10 minutes sometimes. But, Lord, I'm not hearing you yet. And then all of a sudden he'd speak. Yeah, I don't know what. It would just take a while. And we'd know what we'd do. And we'd do it, and it, they were great services. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I must not have done my job in that 30-hour one. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's done, yeah, he's done that to me a lot. Um, that's why we must practice exercising our senses in order to discern good from evil, and that's referenced in Hebrews 5.14. And that's what we're going to do right now in our activation. We're going to exercise and fine-tune our prophetic uh, senses by asking God for a, a word for a partner. <clears throat> now, according to John 10, 27, which says, My sheep hear my voice, we as the Lord's flock are capable of hearing the Christ within us. We're capable of hearing his voice because we're created in his image, and he's a God that speaks. He's a prophetic God, therefore we're prophetic. Now, that is to say that if we do not hear from God, then we are possibly not his sheep. And that's referenced in 1 John uh, 2.19 also. You can read that. Now, in fact, I'm going to turn over there. 1 John 2.19. The Lord said, um, see, when I get up here and praise, he speaks to me and he interrupts. That's why that's not in my uh, message to read it. But we're going to read it. 1 John 2.19. And I know why now he had me to read it or why he's going to have me to read it. Um. 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us. Remember? He's dividing the sheep from the sheep. 
They went out from us because they were not of us. That's what happened last night, folks. This scripture, along with the prophecy that Sally gave me, just brought me back. And see, I do. I go down. I'm biting, fighting all this stuff, and I'm down and then something. But come back up, and I stay up there. I'll go down. And come up. It's, it's a roller coaster ride. They went out from us. Some others, they left us, but they were not of us. So in other words, don't worry about it. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. I mean, that's pretty, pretty, pretty plain, isn't it? In other words, if they'd have really been into what we were doing as his sheep that hear his voice in this local body, in this local church, then they'd still be here. They'd be back tonight. They'd be back tomorrow. Then it says, but they went out that they might be made manifest, in other words, that it would be known that they were not all of us. In other words, all of them were not of us, if you read it in another translation. So that's what happened last night. So if that's the case, if you come in here and you were not to be in agreement with what we're doing and what we're doing is the scriptural word of God and you leave, then you're just not supposed to be with us. And it allows me to take the, that attitude, which doesn't allow the devil to have any any opening or, or have any way with my thought process because you're not supposed to be here. Now, I don't know where you're supposed to be, and you don't know where you're supposed to be because you don't stay here long enough to hear, learn to hear God so he can tell you where you're supposed to be. So you just go wandering around, wandering around, church to church, one, once in a while, whenever it's convenient, you go, and, and you're going to just grow old before you grow up. That's what you do. Lord, help us to grow up before we grow old. But that's what you're going to do. And we have uh, uh, people that still come to this church. They came to us, and I ain't going to mention no names. She came to us, her and her husband, but I speak her. She came to us when we first started the church. First thing she says to me when she walks up to me is, I want you to know that me and my husband, we don't stay in a church no more than a week or two. Well, t about 10 days later, she's gone. Then she comes back six months later, does kind of the same thing, you know. And then she's been back here now, and now she's gone again. And it's hard to pray for those people because they are not with us. Though you give them the chance to be with us, you have to do that. Jesus didn't turn anyone away, but they're not with us. So that scripture helps to understand that. So with all this in mind <clears throat> that we covered, what we're going to do now is to prove that you are one of his sheep by getting a thought from the throne to bless someone else. And it's going to be someone you pick as a partner. We'll do that in a moment. We may not do it on the air. I don't know. I may close, have them close it down and all first. Now, God will speak to you in one of the following ways. A mental image. In other words, you just kind of see this thing. A mental impression. That means it'll come and it leaves an impression, even though it doesn't stay. But, you you know, it's left the impression. A mental picture, much like the Polaroid cam camera, and I explained that. It could, uh, you get one picture and it may expand to be as much as a mural. Just don't do it for 20 minutes like I did. That's a little rude. I didn't know any better. Uh, a physical sensation or a slight pain, uh, pain, and I explained that. You may get a pain you never had, then just tell your person, are you having a pain right here or whatever? You know, you may save their life because if they're about ready to have a heart attack and they're having some pains in their heart, God's going to tell you about it by giving you a kind of pain. And you say, have you got a pain in your heart? And they say, yeah, it's been uh, hurting all day, you know. And you pray and the pain will be gone. You just saved their life. He did it through you. That's how important the prophetic is. Everything ties into the prophetic. Everything. Deliverance ministry ties into the prophetic. Healing ties into the prophetic. Salvation uh, messages tie into the prophetic. Everything ties into the prophetic. And when I say prophetic, I mean hearing God as to the instructions of what you're supposed to do in that uh, particular ministry or, or uh, medium. Um, you may get a, an inward impression. That's more like in here, not so much in here. You know that you know that you know. Uh, a heartfelt impression uh, that may come in the form of, of compassion. That's not your compassion. That's his compassion. Uh, you may hear a still small voice. You may even hear an audible voice within your head. If you hear the, uh, I hear that a lot, audible voice within my head. Nobody else hears it, but I just say, wow, Lord. Uh, and, and when you hear the audible voice, it's like, yeah, you're still here with me, ain't you? Because a lot of times you speak to me audibly in my head when I'm, kind of down and beat up because I'm preaching the truth, you know. And you'll be down and all of a sudden he'll speak. And let me tell you, when he speaks audibly in your head, he speaks with power. 
all of a sudden you can feel really down and he speaks you're up and ready to go you're like revived renovated and everything now according to first corinthians 14 3 prophecy is for edification exhortation and comfort so like i said last night don't bury anybody if you get if you run into that come to me or, and uh, we'll handle it or don't marry anybody and and don't deliver bad news because God doesn't deliver bad news, but he will give them edification, exhortation, and comfort. See, God can deliver bad news in a positive way where they don't even know it's bad news. That's why you got to hear him and hear him good to where you can get the directions how to do that. Also remember that the word you receive is not for you. So don't worry if it doesn't make any sense. It's for the other person. It'll be for your partner. And don't go by the person's natural um, appearance. Uh, Brother Kyle there is wearing some military um, um, pants. You know, looking, oh, I see you're going to go into the military. You know, you see what I'm saying? That's not God. That's just you looking for something. And I would rather you have nothing to say because you're not hearing anything than to make something up. We have had people that make something up. I had a prophet, and he was a prophet, like Balaam was a prophet. Balaam could hear God. That's why he spoke the, the blessings to when uh, he wanted to speak curses, he could hear God, and God may, uh, told him what blessings to speak, and he had to speak them. But we had a prophet, and he was a prophet, and and uh, he came to, Carol and I was been married, what, a year maybe, two, three years? And he came to my wife, and he said, oh, your husband, like it's a prophecy, your husband's getting ready to really do something good for you, and you're going to love it and all that. Then he comes to me, and he says, I think God's telling me that you should re-up your vows with your wife well carol and i look like we've been married for 30 40 years you see we've been married three that wasn't god so i looked at him and said up my vows we've only been married three years <laughs> see what i'm saying i'd rather him just say nothing rather than try to create something that would have been good use the proper terminology remember no religious stuff this is only practice you don't have to say, thus saith the Lord. Occasionally I say that when God gives me permission. It like just comes in the flow. But you don't have to say, thus saith the Lord or any, any of that. All you got to do is say, this is what I sensed, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, this is what I felt, or the Lord is telling me this. You know, just something simple, common language. Now, after I pray a prayer of sanctification, we're going to use our prayer tongues to stir up the gift that's within us. Jude 20 says, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves, on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. See, you're building up your faith. Because prophecy and hearing God is all a step of faith. When you got saved, that was a step of faith. When you get healed, it's a step of faith. To hear God is a step of faith. And see, some of y'all uh, are so used to being in fear because you've been in churches where there's control and manipulation and fear, and you're so afraid to get out of order that you, you're walking in, in fear. This is not about fear. The only fear is the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord should give you Faith, faith to hear him. Um, so all you got to do then is open your heart to God. That's yield to the Holy Spirit. Look to see, listen to hear, and believe to receive. That's where your faith comes in. And like I told you last night, if I pray and God sends the spirit of prophecy down in that dispensation, it's the Holy Spirit in that dispensation, then every thought you have will be God. And the only... You know, and your mind's not going to go blank. Uh, Carol brought something up, uh, yes, uh, last night after the service because she can go back to remember when she started and so forth when we started. And uh, a lot of y'all, you know, your, your mind is thinking all the time. I've had about three thoughts since I could get this uh, sentence out. That's why it was interrupted, if you notice how I'm, I'm doing it. See, so your mind doesn't stop thinking. Now, you say, are you getting something? And you say, no, I'm not getting anything. Well, your mind is still thinking because it just told you you ain't getting anything. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't stop thinking. Your mind doesn't go blank. So all you got to do is kind of think about something and then quit thinking about it. And then all of a sudden pop, something pop in your head. Then you kind of got to go backwards in your mind to say, wow, I just heard that, didn't I? Yeah, and that's God. That's the way he works. That's the way it worked with me in the early days. Now I'm I'm beyond that, but I sit there and I go, well, what am I getting? And then I'm, I'm getting, getting nothing, I guess. And all of a sudden, wow, yeah, I just got that, you know. And I have to go backwards and kind of pull it out of um, behind me in my memory or something because it's already come and gone so quick. Um, now, uh, what we're going to do after we, uh, while I'm shutting down the uh, 
uh, the cameras here because I wanted to get the teaching on. While I'm shutting that down, I'm going to let uh, Carol come up here, and she's going to help you all pick partners. One, two. We got even number of, yeah, we got even number. So if somebody's left out, uh, they can come up here, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give them a word. And uh, I wish uh, Paul Dietrich was here. His mother's in the hospital, so or, or she's at home now. She, God's healing her, but she's, she needs him there to take care of her. Otherwise, he would be able to be somebody's partner. And we used to have other prophets and prophetesses in the church because I tell a lot of people who are new in this, uh, try and team up with a, someone who's already a prophet or so forth. So you can pick a partner and pick somebody you don't know. That's the best thing. And when you're given this, you decide who's going to go first after I pray the prayer tongues and we'll go silent. And then you decide who's going to go first and you just give them a word. And then they in turn give you a word. So... Uh, after the prayer, we'll speak in our tongues for about 30 seconds, and then we'll go silent, and then I'll tell you uh, when to end the, si- end the silence, and um, while you're delivering your word, I'm going to go and make sure the cameras are set, uh, shut off. So by your heads. Heavenly Father, we believe that Christ is in us by way of your precious Holy Spirit. We believe your written word according to 1 Corinthians 2.16, which says we do have the mind of Christ. Therefore, we are believing to receive a thought directly from you, Lord, and from your throne by way of the dispensation of the spirit of prophecy. Father God, we now come before you to ask for a specific impartation that will allow us to receive a word of knowledge to bless our fellow partner. We're asking to receive an impression, a thought, or a picture in which we will share with our partner. In Jesus Christ's name, we hereby ask for forgiveness of all sins so that Satan will have no legal right to our thought patterns or our thought processes as referenced in Romans 6.16. We hereby bind the spirit of divination, the deaf and dumb spirit, the garbler spirit, and any other spirit that would cause us to not hear plainly and directly from you, Lord. We also serve notice on Satan and all his demonic cohorts that may try to interfere with what you have to say by binding and rendering them absolutely powerless to speak. And that's according to Matthew 16, 19, and Matthew 18, 18. We bind you now, uh, you demonic realm, in by the blood of Jesus and by the name of Jesus. We now ask you, Lord Jesus, to share your sanctified thoughts with us as we deliver your word to our partner. And we ask it all in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ and Messiah, and all the prophetic saints in one accord said, Amen. The Lord's changing this a little. Uh, stand up now, and we're going to pick partners. Or we're going to do it another way, but the Lord just changed it. <clears throat> um, and like somebody will be left over. Pick somebody you don't know very well. I mean, don't you know, Doris don't need to give Jim a, a, a prophecy. because it. Uh, pick somebody. And it can be male, male, female, male. It doesn't matter. You got a partner? One, two. You there? And you're with Kyle, aren't you? Come on, Kyle. Oh, Dally. Well, you two have to fight over my wife, and she'll give you a word for sure. All right. Um. Okay. <laughs> Y'all kind of move a little bit away from each other so that you won't disturb them when you're given the word. Kyle, you can just uh, you can just come on up. up up front here, and I'll join you in a minute as soon as I turn that off. So right now, we're going to start praying in our prayer tongues for about 30 seconds, and we're going to go silent, and then um, I'm going to interrupt the silence, and then you, uh, you speak what the Lord has has given you, okay? Let's just pray in our prayer tongues. Father, we just build ourselves up in our prayer tongues. Holy Spirit, we ask that you pray for us. Father, give your people a word. Speak to them. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're come in the spirit of prophecy. Now let's go silent for a few minutes, and then the Lord's going to speak to you. He's going to give you a picture, an impression. You may hear something. You may know that you know that you know. He can speak to you in many ways.
All right. Um, you can figure out who's going to go first and then give them a word, and then you can let the other person give them a word. <laughs> 